Let us just remain standing for a moment for a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to Thee for the privilege that we have of coming to Thee in the way of prayer. Because we've been bid to come this way, we have this assurance that God hears because of promise. Dear Son, that we ask you anything in His name, it will be granted. We pray that you will save the lost tonight. Let's get it out. Comfort the heart of everyone who's come to hear us with our message. And we pray that you will heal all the sick that's in divine presence. And those across the nation who are requesting prayer, who would desire to be here, if they could. We pray that you will get glory from our efforts. We ask Thank in you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am happy to be back again tonight into the service of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I am uh, trusting tonight that his, his presence will bless us all. I was happy to see my good friend, Brother Gardner, from down at the, in the, the state of New York, and we had much fellowship together. I can't pronounce that name, just right. Dean Henson. Dean, Dean Henson. We had a wonderful meeting down there some time ago. Um, and we always remembered of them wonderful times of fellowship that we had with those dear people there in New York. The last a little poem to read tonight from the twelfth of the third chapter of the book of Revelation for a, a reading and pray that God will give us a context from this. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea. Write these things, saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy work, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with good, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and a white woman, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye say that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man Hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. I wish to take the subject for the evening, the door of the door, and may the Lord give us the contents of the text. It is such a striking a text for this time to read. This was our Lord Jesus speaking to John on the Isle of Patmos 2,000 years ago and described exactly the condition of the church in this day. How that it would be neither cold nor hot, just lukewarm. And God does not like his church to be lukewarm. He said, it will be cold or be hot. And because that you just lukewarm, I will spew thee from my mouth. Now that certainly hits the situation today of the modern uh, church today and the Pentecostal church today. Just a lukewarm condition, neither hot nor cold. It would be better if we would be either back in our old 
denominational state status or either be up in the realms of the blessings of God than to sit in a lukewarm condition as we are now. The Lord would appreciate us much more if we would do it. And how today notice in there the condition of the church that they were in this condition and didn't know it. Could you imagine a man on the street that's naked, miserable, blind, wretched, and don't know it? That's the sad part. If he knew it, he would better himself. But if he doesn't know it, how can the poor fellow better himself? See? Because he doesn't know it. And Jesus likened the Pentecostal church in these last days just like that. Thou art naked, miserable, blind, wretched, and don't know it. Now, when he was speaking directly to the remnant of each of those, those, uh, those churches, in the Laodicean church age is the last church age, we know that, and we're in it now, the Laodicean church age, and it's in the Laodicean condition. Now, we notice that he also gave an invitation and said, be zealous, for those I love are chastened. And that is, in other words, scourge and correct and, and whip and... He said, be zealous and repent. Now, he's not speaking to sinners, he's speaking to the church. Be zealous of him and repent from our lukewarm conditions that we're in today. Now we notice... He said, I stand at the door and knock. What is a person knocking at the door for? He's trying to gain the entrance. He has something that he wants to speak to you about. Down through the age, many men has knocked at the door. Great man has knocked at the doors of people. For instance, in the days of the great Caesar, what a, a privilege it would have been for one of his subjects, a poor peasant, for the great Caesar Augustus to come down and knock at his door. Think of what an honor that would be to a, to a peasant when a, the Caesar, the great emperor of Rome, came to his door and not trying to gain entrance to his home to speak with him for some reason. How would it be been a few years ago in Germany when the great Henry of Germany, Adolf Hitler, what if he would have come to the door of one of his soldiers and would have knocked at the door? Wouldn't that not been an honor for the great Hitler in his days of his fame in Germany to come to the door of a modern, poor German soldier and knock on his door to have a council with him? Yeah. What makes it so important is the importance of the person at the door. That's what makes it so great. Tonight, there in this city of Newark, there is not a good Democrat in this city that what would be honored if our president, like Eisenhower, would come to his door and knock tonight, though he differed with him in politics, it would be an honor because of the importance of the president of the United States knocking at his door. Though he differed with him, it would be an important thing for him to do so. Just recently, we had a visitor from England, the Queen. She visited Canada and then came to the United States of America for a visit. And while she was visiting here, what if she would have come to your door and knocked? Just 
think what an honor that would be for any person here tonight to have had the Queen of England, though you're not her subject, yet because she is an important woman, and if she would have come to your door and would have knocked, you would have counted it a great honor, because she's a queen. She's an important person. And to pay a visit to people like common people like we are, what an honor it would have been because of her great importance. But oh, there has never been a knock on the door like there is when Jesus Christ God turned not to the human heart. If the queen should knock at your heart, your door of your home, you would open the door. Say, come in. I am honored to have you. Take anything that's in my house. I'll give you anything that you desire as a souvenir. Or anything that I might do to show my respect. Are you coming to my home? I'd gladly do it. The German soldier would have likewise, no doubt, fallen prostrate on his face and said, Great ear, enter into my house. And anything that I have in my possession is yours, because you are the fear of Germany, or you are the Queen of England, or you are the President of the United States, one of the highest honored men in the nation, President Dwight Eisenhower, you would give him anything that he desired in your house. And if you would not open up your house completely, he would not feel welcome. But Jesus can stand and knock. There's no one as important as the King of Kings to humble himself to come to a low, degraded, sinful heart and knock at that heart to try to gain interest into that heart. And we, in return, turn him away. Oh, you say, but Brother Branham, I opened my heart to the Lord Jesus long ago. He came into my heart years ago. But I'm speaking now to the church. But when he comes into your heart, is he welcome? You know, in the heart there's many little doors, like there is in your house. If the president come to your house and you said, Now, Mr. President, you may sit here at the door, but don't you go in that room or this room. I don't want you in there. He would not be welcome. And if any man that I think enough of to open the door of my house to let him in, he's my guest and he's welcome to anything there is in my house. If I come to your house and didn't feel that welcome, I would not feel like I was welcome at all. But Jesus comes inside the door of the Christian's heart, but we've got little apartments in our heart that we cannot come in. Oh, you say, I'm willing for him to be my Savior. I don't want to go to hell, but I want to be saved. Jesus, you can be my Savior, but he wants to be more than your Savior. He wants to be your Lord. Lord is ownership, ruler. That's why the church gets in its lukewarm condition. It accepts Christ as Savior, but not as Lord. Christ wants to be the Lord of your being, to rule and to guide you. 
That's why he knocks at the heart. To come in for that purpose is to be your spiritual guide as to be the ruler of your welfare. But in our hearts we have many little apartments. I wish to speak now on some of these little apartments. One of them is a little closet over on one side that many people who call themselves Christians, yet they would not dare to let Jesus in that little compartment because it's the apartment of selfishness. Now you know it's among so-called Christians. Right. Selfish motives. Oh, it's uh, all right if it's for me and my denomination. It's all right. But if my denomination has nothing to do with it, then I don't want anything to do with it. That's a little apartment of selfishness that all Christians ought to open the door and say, Come in, Lord Jesus, and be Lord of my heart. Then there's a little compartment in the heart called indifference. Oh, what a condition that thing gets into. A little indifference. You want to be just a little indifferent towards others. You want your own way. You'd be willing to let Jesus in, but you want to continue to live in the same place that you've always lived. You don't want to get away from the old associates. You just don't give them up. You think they're nice people, and you just don't want to give them up, so you want to be a little different. That's another bad apartment in the heart. Then there's another little door called jealousy. I don't know whether you Yankees know anything about it or not, but down south we have a lot of that. Oh, just a little inferior to the other man. Just a little better than the other church. If the Joneses paint their sets red, you've got to have yours red. Yeah. Oh, what a horrible spirit to be in a Christian. Why don't you let Christ come in and make him lord over that little spirit room of selfishness and indifference. Let him gain the entrance to your heart and to everything that's in your heart. Just surrender your whole being to him. Let him be God and ruler of your entire being. There's another little apartment that I'd like to speak on. And that is uh, the apartment in there that's called faith. So many people want to accept Christ as their Savior, but they say the days of miracles is past. So they don't want to believe that the days of miracles are now. Christ can't get into their heart. If Christ can gain entrance to the heart tonight of every person here, there would not be a feeble person among us in ten minutes. The faith is in you. But you're afraid to open up the door and let him be Lord of that faith. You try to sympathize with the part of the Bible. Say some of it is right, but the other is not inspired. What causes that is perhaps maybe some person not knowing any difference taught you that. All of God's Word is inspired. And if we'll open up our hearts and open up our door in our little room of faith, Christ coming to be Lord, He'll show great and mighty works and signs if He can only gain interest to that heart of faith. Oh, you say, I believe it to be that all these things pass with the apostles. See, you keep the door closed. Christ will come into the midst of the people and do signs and wonders on people. And they let that little compartment stay shut. Oh, it might be all right for her, but for me, my case is different. There is no difference with Christ. He's no respect. 
effective person among the old. Cancer or toothache. It matters not for them if he can be Lord over the matter. You're just going to open up that heart to lay it in that faith door so he can be ruler. Now, it casts down reason. When you have Christ into the compartment of your heart as faith, then reason fly out. Just recently, we had a we had a great meeting here of the famous Billy Graham. When Billy Graham was in Louisville, I was at his breakfast, a great servant of the Lord. And he held up the Bible at the breakfast. He said, This is the example. He said when St. Paul went somewhere and had a convert the next year, he went back and had 50 out of that one. But said, I go and have 20,000 in the city, and in a year's time there's scarcely 20. Oh, how I wanted to say something. I just long to say it. Billy, what's the matter? They have an intellectual conception of Christ and never open up the heart and let it be Lord. If a man, and don't think that justifies the Baptist, that's the Pentecostals and the full gospel also. You accept it as some sign or some wonder or some emotion or some evidence. The evidence that Christ is in the heart bears the fruit of the Spirit. Faith, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, patience. That's the fruit of the Spirit. But we have confused it with other things, divine healing gifts, speaking with tongues, or oil in the hands, or blood in the face, or some little sensation. We've confused the real Spirit of God with that and accepted something bogus instead of the person Christ yeah. in the heart. Yeah. And you see what a condition the church, the full gospel church, has got into? It's the lady of CNA to bring to pass the very words that our blessed Savior spoke there in the Bible. Luke on, dance by the music, shout and clap hands. Oh, them things are all right. But if Christ isn't there when the hand clapping's over, when the speaking with tongues are over, when the healing service is over, when the music stops, if that beat cannot peace, then doors of faith turning wide open, do let him be Lord over the situation. It doesn't do us any good to play the music or clap our hands or speak in tongues or have a healing service. That's right. We let him so far, but now, Lord, you stay back there. You might have done that to the, to the brother so-and-so or to sister so-and-so or to their child, but my case is different. It is a difference. You're the one that's making the difference by keeping him out of your faith door. You see what I mean? He won't inside there so he can push open the door and expose all your unbelief and become Lord of the situation. The doctor says you can't get well. You take his word. Christ said by his God, you were healed. See, you will close the door on him. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. The Bible says that. But sometimes you let the doctor push the door in your face. Not only the doctor won't do it so much as the pastor will many times. All oh, those things are fanaticism. If our church were had said something like that the Lord had given, it would be in our church. Oh, you and your church. I think it makes the Lord sick of his stomach. He said he would spew him from his mouth. It's time that America woke up. The age of revival is about finished in this land. That is true. The Lord Jesus finished to fulfill his word. He must keep his word. I've often wondered 
When they would see his word manifested, what do they do about it? Oh, well, some says it's a telepathy. The other says it's some wild imagination. Examine it by the word. God's word promises and heavens and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never fail. Open up the door of faith. Jesus went on earth. He knew that that scripture pertained to him. When he said, you destroy this body, I'll raise it up in three days. The prophet had already said, I will not suffer my holy one to see corruption. Neither will I leave his soul in hell. He knew that scripture pertained to him, for he was the Messiah, and he knew it. His unfailing faith put him in position to know that he was the perfect born son of God. His pure faith will put you in position to know that every divine promise of God's Bible is for you. Just as sure as that pertains to him, every promise pertains to you. Your healing, your salvation, your freedom from sin and from selfishness and from your indifference and your little turtle shell that you put yourself into. Christ wants to come in and be Lord and ruler and to set you free from these things. But we won't do it. It's to fulfill the scriptures that they would be lukewarm. And they are. Now notice this is not personally to anyone, just as the Holy Spirit will point it to you. But notice I just the word. The people today, they don't want to open up their hearts to those things. They don't want to believe it. Or they try to apply it somewhere else or to somebody else. Knowing not that it's to you. You say, well, now, wait a minute, Brother Ben. I spoke in tongues 10 years ago. That was very fine. But what is Christ to you today? Are you still seeing his marvelous powers? Does he still bring the same thrill? Does something go to you when you see his mighty hand begin to move and sinners be converted? Does it bring you to all my prayer? Does it bring you to fasting? Does it send you to the altar quickly to work with someone to instruct them how to come through to the Holy Spirit? Does it warn your heart to go into the neighborhood and seek out the lost and speak to the milkman, to the meter man, to the man on the street? Those things does not accompany that experience that you received long ago. Something happened. You pushed him out the door. God goes to the heart. Then um, yes. there is another door. Oh, there is many that we could speak of. But because of time, there's another one that I want to speak on just for a few moments, and that's the door of the eye. Oh, you say, I've got good sight, brother man. You may physically have very good eyes and spiritually completely blind. Right. Now, you don't see with your eyes anyhow. Jesus said unto Nicodemus, the great ruler, Very, very, I say to you, except the man be bound again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The word see by the right translation is understand. You see something before you said, I just can't see it. You mean you can't understand it? Jesus said, Come and buy from me some eyes that I might put on your eyes, and your eyes might be open, and you could see, for you're blind and you're naked, and you're miserable and wretched and poor. The churches has got the biggest buildings they've ever had. The best polished scholars, I guess, has walked into the pulpit. They have it now. But yet the church is weaker and than everyone. 
It's growing weaker all the time. Notice, fire me some eye salve, that I might put the eye salve on the eyes. When I was a little boy born down in the southern states of Kentucky, I don't guess many of us ever down there, we were real poor. And you seen the little babies when they would get to uh, wake up in the morning and they'd have some kind, Mama used to call it matter, in their eyes. And the little eyes would be stuck together. And Mama would go out and get some cream grease out of the old kiddo where Grandpa had been trapping cream and rinsing out the grease and put it on her eyes and soften up those little matters that stuck her eyelids together. It become that way while we were asleep. And that's what's the matter with the full gospel church tonight, asleep on the job. And it'll take more than two weeks to open your eyes. It'll take the oil of the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of the church that they might see again. Open your eyes. It alarms me as I cross through the nations, and especially in America, and see great signs that the Holy Spirit will do, and great wonders that he will perform, and the people step as though nothing had happened. They just don't see it. Oh, I'm praying for a revival in America. And I'm wondering sometimes if it will, if I'm not praying in vain. I hope not. Today I met with some man from your name state, and with the Lord's willing, the complete month of May is going to be a revival in here if the Lord permits. We're coming here for a one solid month in May for a month's revival. Want to try with all that in me if God will permit to come. To bring God us that the people might be anointed and their eyes be opened. Oh, California men had the meeting, but you people have been neglected, I feel. Up on the east side here. They don't come because there's not much money and so forth. But we don't need money. What we need is God and the doors of our hearts open. And these New England states have been neglected. The little mountain countries and throughout here, there hasn't been a great distance. They all seem to go to California, the preacher's graveyard, and they're staying. Getting documented out there with some of those fantastics, and away they go. But oh, I pray God shape this New England country again. And I'll say this in respect of the gospel. And of the Lord Jesus, if this nation ever has a revival, it will never have it up on intellectual theology. It will take the real, true, genuine, Holy Spirit power and manifestation to shake the people until they are long to see the glory of God. We need it so badly, and it's so badly needed here. As I go through the cities of these great eastern countries and see as everywhere, sin on every side. But God has I say, those that I love, I chasten and rebuke those, and be zealous and repent. Now, I have wondered when in the teaching the Holy Spirit, taking the Bible, who wrote the Bible, who gave the promises, that Jesus said, The things that I do shall you also. And then he'll turn that back around after explaining it word by word, page by page, scripture by scripture. And the Holy Spirit will turn right around and perform everything that he promised to do. And full gospel people will set as though nothing happened. We need to open our eyes and see the day and the hour that we are living in. What's the matter? You become common. It becomes a common thing to you. 
Well, some time ago, if you'd only notice, as I was going to say, crossing the country, seeing the goodness of God, how good He is to us, and how indifferent we treat Him. If I knocked at your door, and you didn't come out and let me in, but just peeped out the trellis and looked and said, Oh, that preacher, Branham, go well, back, I'll let him in some other time. You'll have an awful time getting me back again. And if I come to your door or you come to mine and I treated you that way, it would be likewise, but not our blessed Lord. He's so good, I stand and knock. Continuation. He that knocketh, not just peck and run, but knocketh. Continually. The great artist, I think, called his name now, who painted the famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door. I think he was a Greek. And when he met years of painting, studying, every famous picture has to first go through the Hall of Critics before it can go in the Hall of Fame. That is men who know how to criticize. And when one of the critics of the picture came to the painter, he said, There is one thing you lack on your picture. And he said, What is it? He said, You have a door with no latch on it. Oh, the painter said, The latch is on the inside. Now, that's the way it is. You have the latch on the inside. And Christ cannot open your heart being out of it. Neither can he go in the closet when you've got yourself shut up in there. You've got the latch in your own power. But his goodness to stand and knock. Some time ago down in my Southland, there was an old minister friend. And he was a wonderful old brother. And they had a colored brother there. A colored man brother. And his name was Gable, and we all called him Gabe. He was a good old fella, but we just couldn't keep him lined up with the church. He was just wouldn't go to church. And we'd say, Gabe, why don't you come home to church all hours real Sunday? And one day he and the minister went hunting. Now old Gabe was a very poor shot. He couldn't hit nothing. But they went hunting that day, and they hunted all day long. And when they come in that evening, they were so loaded with game that they either could hardly walk. They had rabbits and ducks and birds all over them. Well, they couldn't hardly walk. And old Gabe was so loaded until he was back behind the pastor to hardly pack his gun. And while they were making their way down an old familiar pathway, Old Gabe walked up and tapped him on his shoulder. And as the pastor looked around, there were tears in the old darky's eyes. And he said to him, What's the matter, Gabe? He said, Parson, Sunday morning, that's tomorrow. You're going to find me at the moon's bench. And I intend to take my place in the church until death sets me free. The pastor said, I am so glad to hear that, Gabe. But there's one thing I want to ask you, Gabe. Why the sudden change? Why? You know, you've changed all of a sudden. He said, Parson, you know, I was a very poor shot. I can't hit nothing. But just look at the game that I had. He said, I was just walking along here thinking. He surely must love me or he wouldn't have given it to me. If you would only to a place that the Holy Spirit could open your eyes to God's goodness to you, it would bring repentance if you could only get your eyes open. But it's become a common thing. One time a man was going to the seashore for a little rest. And he wanted the smell of the freshness of the salt water. He wanted to hear the loud scream of the seagull. He wanted to watch the great waves as the salty water burst up into great 
huge waves and splash and roll back to splash again. Oh, he was so thrilled to know that he would be down to the seashore. He longed to see and to enjoy the presence of the sea. On his boat down, he met an old salt. A salt is an old sailor. And he went and said, where are you going? He said, down to the seashore to enjoy the blessings of the roaring of the sea. To see the waves as they jump and to hear the gulls. He said, they're just birds. That's just salt water. I don't see anything to be thrilled about it. What was the matter? He had seen it so much until it became so common to him so he didn't notice it anymore. And God's goodness to you people has become so common so you don't enjoy it anymore like you used to. Oh, if God would open our eyes and give us a desire to do something for him. Second night of revival, 150 people in the audience. Do you know, I wonder, what should happen if our eyes to see what our Lord did last night? To see what he'll do any night. Each Christian soul should be so zealous and so full of fire of God. His eyes open to see the coming of the Lord, for these are signs and mileposts of his soon appearing. And we see it, and the Gentile world is just about at the end. And we see those things. And we yawn, pat our mouth, and go to sleep, and why did he preach so long? And the Lord comes down and performs things like he said he would, when he stood and talked to the woman at the well of Samaria, and there she was standing there, and he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have none. I said, that's right, you have five. And the one you have now is not your husband. Look how quickly her eyes come open. She said, sir. I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, we know that when the Messiah cometh, yet longing, waiting, looking, we know, we Samaritans know, that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things, he'll do these signs, you must be his prophet. Jesus said, I'm he that speaks to you. Full of zeal, her eyes open. She left the water pot at Jacob's well. And into the city she went, warning the message, Come see a man who told me the things that I have done. Yeah. Isn't that the very Messiah? Yeah. But we, we say, well, well, it could be mental telepathy. I don't understand it all, so I guess it'll come out all right. Oh, my. Look at the Jews. When Philip was so full of zeal, his eyes open that he was in the presence of Messiah. He had to find his friend. And he walked 30 miles around the mountain and he found him under a tree praying. And he said, come and see who we found. We have found something. Oh, he wanted everyone to know, every friend he had and everything to know of it. Come see who I found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. It's the Messiah that we waited on. And uh, he never got a very warm reception. But that didn't bother him a bit. Oh, he said, could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, now you come go with me and find out for yourself. You just come see for yourself. And when he got in the presence of the Lord Jesus in the prayer line or in the audience, wherever it was, his eyes were still closed. He was just coming on the count of somebody invited him. Now, here was a Jew. Let's we'll see what he'll say. Jesus never healed his crippled leg. Neither did he go to speak in some language to him that he knew not. But he looked at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom is no guile. Quickly. Right. The oil went to soak him over the night sleep. He began to look and he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? How do you know who I am? And he said, Before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. Then his eyes flew out of the way open, 
a country where may, may become the first to start the old-fashioned revival of the Bible days in the ending of this great nation. Grant it, Lord. Bless these who raise their hands. May they become fully surrendered to thy presence now. And Lord Jesus, come, most all of them have been in the meeting, and they know what to expect the Lord to do. And I pray that you'll manifest your great power tonight and open every eye, every ear, every understanding, sanctify our bodies, our souls, our spirits with our presence, while we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be gracious and good to you all. Now, don't be weary when we think that there's just a few people here. That has nothing to do with it. Christ has promised to meet where two or three were gathered together. I would put every effort with two people as I would if it was two million would be just the same. How do I know what our Lord wants? Only responsible for the word. Now, as we're going to pray for the sick, as it is my custom to pray for the sick and to try to preach not just part of the gospel, but the full gospel, all of it. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the chastening of our peace was upon him with his stripes, we were healed. That's the full gospel. And if it lay within my power, I would be so happy tonight if I had power to heal the sick people that's in this building. Most of the people that come to my services to hear the preaching and so forth are sick people need. If I had the power to do it, I would do it, my loving friends. I certainly would do it. I have not the power to do it. And I say this with respect and reverence. I don't believe that the man on earth has power to do it. Not divine healing, because divine healing was purchased at Calvary. It's your faith in a finished work. Christ healed you when he striped for you at Calvary. He was past tense wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were past tense healed. Now, you cannot pay for the same twice. It's already purchased. If our Lord Jesus stood here tonight on this platform and a sick person would come to him and say, My Lord and Master, I recognize you to be my Lord and my Master. I am sick and needy. Oh, Master, will you heal me? What do you think he would say? He would have to be something on this matter. Child, can you not take my word that I have done that? He could not say, yes, I will heal you, because he has already done it. Certainly he has. When he was sure on earth, the Lord Jesus, did he claim that he healed the people? Be careful. No. He said, it's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. How many knows that? Yeah. He doeth the works. Now, if he does the work then, then what did Jesus say in St. John 5, 24? Or, let's see, no, in St. John 5, 19 it is. Jesus, after he had passed the pool of the Bethesda with a crippling blind was lame, the Father had showed him a vision, and he went out and looked through that crowd till he found a certain person that was laying on a little pallet. And the little pallet, I mean, knows what a pallet is. That's good. I was raised on one. Just a quilt laying on the floor. There was a big bunch of children. We didn't have bedroom for all, so we, I spent most of the time being the oldest of the family on a little pallet. And this man was laying on a little pallet. And Jesus come by and seen him and knew that he had been in this condition for many years. He said, take up your bed, go to your house. Walked away and left the rest of them. Why? Father hadn't showed him nothing about them. Then he was questioning the man with the bed on his shoulder, and then Jesus was questioned. And here's what he said, St. John 5, 19. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing with himself. But what he sees the Father do, that doeth the Son likewise. Now that's either the truth or it is an error. If that's an error, then Jesus is false. Jesus never performed one miracle without first God showing him in a vision what to do. Or he told something wrong there. And if he told something wrong, he wasn't the Son of God. 
Very, very, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing. When you shall for what he sees the Father do, that does the Son likewise. See, Lazarus, the resurrection, all of these things the Father had shown you. Now, there was a little woman. They're coming to the audience, and she did not, the Father had not showed her, showed him nothing concerning her, but she believed. So she went through the crowd, and she touched his garment, and went out and sat down. And Jesus turned and said, Now he has touched me. And Peter rebuked him and said, Lord, the whole crowd is touching you. And when I say you touch me, Jesus said, But I got weak. Strength, virtue, and anyone knows virtue means strength. Virtue has gone from me, I got weak. Then he looked around over the audience until he found the little lady. And then she had a blood issue. And he told her that she was healed. Her faith had made her well. And she felt in her heart that the blood issue stopped and she was well. Oh, what a difference. Now you say, oh, if he was here tonight, I'd like to do that. But he is here. Well, Brother Branham, is there a scripture that tells us you do the same thing? Yes, there is. Thanks be to God. The Bible says the New Testament. He is our high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Hebrews. We can touch him with the feeling of our infirmity. Then how would we know we touched him? He turned and said the same thing that he did then. If we touch him. All right. Then how would I know it? Now he, after he left the earth, he became the vine. Or he became the one through where the Spirit comes. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now the vine does not bear fruit. It only produces the life, and the branch bears fruit. So the church is the branches. And if it's really connected to Christ, it'll bear the fruit of Christ. The Bible said in Hebrews 13, 18, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he did those things in the days gone by, he must do it today to do the same. Oh, I trust that that's so plain that even the children will understand it. I can't do it in human lips. But may the Holy Spirit come into your compartments tonight. Open up the doors of faith. Open up your eyes that you can see. Open up your hearing, your understanding. Open up your entire being and you come and say, Now, Jesus, be Lord in my hands. You are welcome in tonight, Lord. Here I am, take me, I'm sick, I'm miserable, I'm a doubter, I'm an unbeliever. I've been so skeptic of all of it. Come in and be my Lord. Watch what takes place. Oh, the joy bells of heaven will ring in you. Your eyes will become open and see that it's not some little ed- uneducated creature that can't even speak correct English, that has nothing to do with it. It's the presence of the manifestation of his being according to his promise of his word. God granted, now, Father, the rest is in your hands. I have said what I thought that you would have me say, and whatever is accomplished, your name shall be praised. Granted, Father. I commit this little group of people into your hands, and with them I present myself as your servant. Now, Lord, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word. And I pray that tonight that you will work wonders among us for the glory of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. How many sick people in our midst? Just look. How many sure without prayer cards? Raise your hand. Well, I guess two-thirds has not prayer cards. That don't have to have prayer cards. You just have to open the door. Now, uh, just would you spare me another five minutes for something I, the Holy Spirit puts on my heart that I believe would help you right now? Just spare me just five minutes. What is faith? I've talked about the door. Now let's find out what it is. What is faith? Oh, it's been so misinterpreted. Many call faith emotion. Oh, jumping and shouting. Now remember, when I'm speaking of those things, I believe in shouting. 
I believe in praising the Lord. I believe there's a gift of speaking in tongues and interpretation. I believe in everything the Bible says, but we can't go to seed on one thing. See? Get the giver, and the gift will take care of itself. See? But if you get the gift without the giver, I could give you an apple off the tree, and you'd still not have the apple tree. See? See? And this tree has nine different kinds of fruit on it. So, if this tree is a church, and one, one gift differs from the other, by one gift we can't say we've got it, all nine gifts have to be working in the church. And the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, faith, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, goodness, meekness, temperance. There's the fruits of the Spirit. Now, if that's operating in your life, with the other, blessed be the name of the Lord. But if some of it's there without the rest of it, be careful you're on dangerous ground. Satan can impersonate most anything that God does, but you can tell it's not mixed with love or neither has it faith. The word being preached, not profit them, not being mixed with faith. I asked for you to give me bread, and you said the purchase price is 25 cents. And you give me the 25 cents, I'm just as happy as if I had the bread. The bread's mine because I've got the purchase power of a loaf of bread. Now, I can be just as happy standing here with 25 cents if I was starving to death, and a loaf of bread would save my life, and maybe I'd have to go six blocks before and stop at every traffic light, and be stopped 20 times by police and criticized by many critics. And I might be so hungry when I get there, I'll have cramps and all kinds of symptoms, but as long as I got the 25 cents, what makes the difference? Faith, if it's in your heart and God has planted it there and you believe it, there's nothing going to stand in your way. Every doctor could tell you contrary. Every pastor could tell you something different. That wouldn't make one second difference. You've got it. And you're just as happy when it drops in your heart as you are when you possess what you're asking for. There you are. Now, if our blessed Lord will be so good to come here tonight and will manifest himself in our presence and show that he's here. Now, how is faith done? You say, Brother Branham, i got a sick child. My mother's sick. I'm sick myself. Would you heal us? I wish I could, but I can't. But through a divine gift, it could show you that every promise in the Bible is true and it's yours. And when Christ is present, then reach up and say, Lord Jesus, manifest yourself to me just now and give me faith to believe it. Then into your heart got that purchasing power. I have it. No scramble for the prayer line. It's going down the street rejoicing. It settles. It's the evidence of things you do not have, but you have the purchase power. And then the Bible said that Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Abraham endured. When God spoke to him, he knew it. And he called those things which were not as though they were. How's he going to do it? Seventy-five years old, his wife sixty-five, about twenty-five years past menopause. How is she going to have a baby? That wasn't even considered. Neither the deadness of his body or her womb. He staggered not at the promise of God to unbelief, but was strong giving praise to God. And we claim to be his children. Now do you see why we're lukewarm? You see why Christ, does this fulfill his word? If he'll come here tonight and manifest himself, what are you doing? Knocking at the heart. I know you're lukewarm, you're neither hot or cold. Oh, but I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, I'll come in. I'll sup with him. Uh, you talk your problem, Lord, if you will heal me, I promise you, I'll quit sinning. I'll quit doubting. If you'll just give me the promise, you. all of a sudden something begins to move in your heart. He's suffering with you. Oh, I pray that he will. Now, Billy, what prayer cards do you use? One to a hundred. All right. Fifteen to a hundred. Is that right? Fifty to a hundred. All right. Where did we start from last night, Billy? Fifty? Let's start a little farther somewhere tonight in the union. Last night, I believe, was 80. Tonight, let's start at 75 tonight. Who has the prayer card? You, 75. 
Now, there's a little bitty card. The way we do this is just keep a lake port. Is that the fairground? And I lost a brother, you know, and so then I was late for the meeting. But tonight on the, the grounds, I'll tell you what happened. Now, this is all new to you people, but friends, if you ever hear of me preaching one thing, and before the service is in, I want to tell you and let the man here testify, and those who know how infallible those visions are. They are perfect. Call the city, call the mayor of the city of Jeffersonville, or someone call the police station. Go down around where it's happened for 48 years. And find out if there's ever a failure anywhere. It's sin. It's God. So we we'll open our hearts. On the platform, along the meeting there, there was an Indian woman came. I always feel sorry for them, the Indian woman. And she was blind, I could see. Her eyes were turned back. And I said, the woman is blind. Then the Holy Spirit began to speak. And it said, um... Uh, uh, you had a stroke in the brain that pulled the eyes backwards. And nine years, no peace day and night, but a constant suffering. Think of what that poor woman went through. Nine years of suffering. What taking place? After all those nine years, then the Holy Spirit said, Thus saith the Lord, you are healed. And while she was standing there, her eyes come open, her eyes drop back over not right, and I see her weeping. Now my mother, as you all know, my mother's a half Indian too. My mother's mother comes from the Oklahoma of the Cherokee Reservation. And so my mother looked just like her. And Mama getting old kind of has a shaking of the palsy when she gets just a little excited. And that poor old woman was shaking. It looked just like Mother. And I I never noticed her eyes as yet. And so I said, Can you see? And she said, Yes, sir. And when she went from the platform, they let some Indians led her in and she led them back out. And while she was there, there was a man of the Lutheran layman league. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. And they were, he had his wife sitting over this way in the fairgrounds. She had been ill with a bleeding tumor for uh, about four years. She had eaten nothing but liquid. And when the doctors could not build her blood up because she's 80 something years old, and they were going to give her blood transfusions into her for the tumor was bleeding inside, and they were going to operate in about a week. And this old Lutheran brother sat there, and they over a little city called Ukiah. Uh, they were building a Lutheran church. And sitting there, it thrilled him so much. He said, oh, in his heart, now, not out loud, I had my back to him, and he said, oh, Lord, if you will heal my wife tonight and let that man call her, I'll believe it. And said, if you heal her, I will take the $500 for the operation and give it to that little Lutheran church that's being built. And he no more than repeated the prayer in his heart till the great Holy Spirit turned and told him who he was. And said, you were praying that if God would heal your wife that you'd donate the $500 for the operation to the Lutheran church. And he just fainted. So he... He got up and he said, friends, that's the truth. I said, God doesn't want your money, but it's your faith and she's healed for it's thus saith the Lord. And the next morning at the Christian businessman's breakfast, when Brother Rose uh, out there, he knew the family. And the lady had been to the doctor and they couldn't even find one trace of tumor. And she was at the Christian businessman's breakfast that Saturday morning, eating scrambled eggs and ham, enjoying herself at 80-something years old because of the goodness of the Lord Jesus. Oh, that's just a little thing to what he does. He's great and full of mercy. Now, let us be reverent and say.
All right. How many we got lined up? About where we start right now. Let's pray. Most gracious Lord. Right now, even in this little audience, your word is to be manifested or we are false witnesses of your word. And Lord, I realize that to take the position to represent you, your spirit, what a great thing that is. And I'm unworthy, Lord. And we're all unworthy. But, Father, God does not look upon our unworthiness, but you honor your word. And I pray for the sincerity of my heart. Oh, great Jehovah, let it be known this night that thou art still God. And you keep your word, whether it's good or small or large. Manifest yourself. And then may the people, the faith that they need, when you knock at the door, may that faith anchor key. May all the doors of their heart be open. And may they rise in faith and accept their healing. And the things that you have provided for them. Forgive me in my trespasses, Lord. Forgive us all our trespasses. And now condition our hearts to receive thee. And come, blessed Savior, and heal every person in the building tonight. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now I would ask for the next few moments for your undivided attention. Be reverent. But if the Lord should speak to your heart that you have faith, and it's dropped into your heart, then receive it. Then say in your heart, thank you, Lord Jesus, it's settled. Now many of you will not be in the line, but that doesn't stop the healing. God can heal you anywhere in here if you just look to him and believe. Now, remember, I say before, I do not say that he will do it. I, I can't say that. I don't know. But he, all these years, he's never failed me. I don't believe he'd fail me tonight. So that's the faith that I put in you from the message that you know of Fred Nibble. I might say this. These messages are on tape. Mr. Gold here, Mr. Mercer, has them on tape if you wish them. To set back in these prayer lines to see what the Holy Spirit said to you, or what more, or the message tonight. It's on tape. All right. The Lord be blessed. I hope and trust that each of you will receive faith. Now, I'm sure you realize my position. Even though in this little group here, here stands a woman. I, is this the patient? Would you come here just a minute? Here's the lady I suppose we're strangers to each other. We've never met before. This is our first time meeting. Now, could you imagine, do you wish to come up and take the place? You're welcome. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's the lady. Now, what do I base it up on? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm basing it up on the Bible, on a promise that God gives us. Now, how, if God keeps his promise to this, then he'll keep every promise that he made. Right. Not 1,900 years ago, but today also. He's the I am, not the I was. Right. The I am right. now. Now, if this lady is sick, I don't know. It may be domestic. It may be financial. It may be, I don't know. But say if she is sick, I, if I could do one thing to help the woman to be well and wouldn't do it, I would be an unfit person to represent Jesus Christ as a minister. I would be a brute. Even if I was a doctor and could perform an operation for her if she needed it. And because she didn't have money and wouldn't do it, I wouldn't be worthy to be a doctor. That's right. I'm not a doctor. 
uh, uh, I'm just the servant of the Lord. His Lord, and you were, in, some of these men sitting here with gray hair in their head was preaching when I was a boy. So it's just something God has given to you, and he just lets me represent him in this manner. As you know, I'm not much of a preacher, but my gift is vision. This is my field. Therefore, I feel just at home standing here as the minister would in his pulpit or his Sunday school teachers would with your legs. Now, ladies, this is a picture, again, like I was speaking, Jesus with the woman at the well. They were two strangers, and, and he was not in his home country. He was away from his home country. He was uh, from down at Nazareth, and now he was um, in another land. And there was a strange woman, and when he began to speak to her, he told her, he talked to her till he found what the trouble was. Now, I remember he was on his road to Jericho. That's like straight from Jerusalem to Jericho. But he had me go by Samaria. The vision told him, go to Samaria. That's all he knows to do. He sat there on the well, and when the woman came out, he felt something was going to take place. So he spoke to the woman and said, bring me a drink. And he started the conversation. As soon as he found what her trouble was, he told her, and she recognized it to be the son, to be the Messiah. That was the sign of the Messiah in that day. The Samaritan recognized it. The Jew recognized it. Philip, as a Gentile, would you recognize it? Would Jewish Gentiles recognize it the same as the Jew and the Samaritan? The sign of the Messiah. Not the sign of Brother Branham. The sign of Messiah. Now, if you will reveal to me what you're here for, now you know what is truth or not. You'll know. And if it isn't truth, you have liberty to say that the man's wrong. But if it is the truth, then you give witness to the power of God. And us never met, never seen each other, know not each other, just here we stand. Now, I believe God, that God will do it. How many out there? Does anybody know the woman? Anybody in the building know the woman? Yes, some people here know this. All right, if the Lord will reveal to this woman, let her be judged, and say that it's the truth, how many of you say, I believe it's the sign of Messiah and his soon coming, I want to accept it. There's nothing in dark corners that's right here before all. I trust that he will. Now, this is speak to you, so I'll find what your trouble is, but what he wants me to tell you, then God be honest. Now, I'm trusting that God will do it for this lady. To make her well, heal her, or give her what she's asking for. The first thing, the woman is suffering. I see her walking through the house real nervously. You're extremely nervous. That's right. And that's called from a, a female disorder, which the doctor told you. It was a fallen wound. That's right. And you've had an operation of a female disorder. That's what they have to That's the truth. Now, could I help the woman? No. Do you believe? Then it's over. Father in heaven, bless this dear person. May she go now. And may that little purchase power, as I spoke a while ago, a 25 cents, may she go with that in her heart now. The Lord Jesus interpreted back to me through human lips exactly my condition. I believe him, and it's a settled thing. Amen. God grant you. A lady, I do not know you. I suppose this is our first time meeting? It is. People in the audience are praying to see you. That's what that's just talking to us. Something happened in the audience. I was just talking to the lady that something is happening. Now, um, if the Lord Jesus will reveal to me what your years thought as a man, I, I could do nothing for you. If it was finances you wanted, 
I, I think I got I got about twenty dollars or thirty cents. I can let you have that. But I, 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 if it was domestic trouble, I could only pray. If it's sickness, I can't deal. But all of those things are yours freely by your faith in Christ. Now, to let you, let you know whether he's concerned about you or not, if he will tell me why you're, what you're here for, would you believe him? May he grant it. I'm looking into the face of a woman that I've never seen in my life. But the woman has had an accident. She fell. And she tore the ligaments loose in her leg. And she can hardly walk. And the ligament won't go back to the right place. That's exactly what it is. Thus saith the Lord. That is true. Now, would you believe if I'll pray for you? You believe that whatever, I don't know what I said. Did you hear that voice? That wasn't me. How did I know what was wrong? But what, I, what was said was right. That was him just using my voice. What is it you say? It's the way I have just committed myself to the Spirit. And he does the talking. It's just a gift that I just submit myself. And your own faith does it. That's exactly right. Your faith does it. Watch here, that you might know the glory of God. Here's just a woman sitting right back there, second from the end, right back there. She was praying when that had taken place. She has sinus trouble. That's right. And if you believe God, God will make her well. Do you believe it, lady, with all your heart, that the Lord will make you well? If you believe it, then have what you ask for. The lady missed it. Turned black over. And it moves again. That's where you fail. Why aren't you alert? How did you miss that? Here, it goes to a heavy set woman. Sitting on the end to show the sovereignty of God. The woman back there, heavy set sitting on the end, is suffering with a lady's trouble, a female trouble. That's right. If that's right, raise your hand. You had it, but you don't have it now. Your faith has made you well. Amen. What did she touch? She never touched me. She touched the high priest. Now you may go, sister. You'll get well. I guess you go which way? This way? Over? Doesn't matter. Just watch this. Oh, the sovereignty of God. God is able to be stones to rise with an Abraham. When God makes a move, he will do it. Now here is the lady who is totally stranger to me. I don't know the lady. I've never seen her in my life as I know her. We stand strangers. We were probably born miles apart, years apart. And here we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. But if the Lord will tell me what you're here for, would you, just like to them people, would you believe it, baby? Is there anybody here who knows the lady? Raise your hand. All right, you must see from here then. They know her. Then you know her condition. I don't. But if the Lord will reveal it, then let her be judged and you be judged. How many knows what the woman's up here for? Raise your hands out there. Is anybody up here? All right. Yeah, all right. Maybe some of her sisters or someone. May the Lord grant it, sisters. The lady is up here because she has wants me to pray for a spiritual problem she has. That's right. And another thing, she has arthritis. That stuff saith the Lord. Raise your hand. How many knows that that's true? There it is. Now, you see, more I would talk to the lady, more would be told. See, for reasons, see, I got quite a line here. I want to get as many through as I can. That's the reason I don't talk so much. I'm just worn out. This is supposed to be my vacation. But because of Brother Hutchinson and Brother Nicole, they call me, I left home to come here for this little time of fellowship. She seems to be a lovely person. 
redeemed by signs of my mother. Now let me talk to her again. Yes, you have a girl too that you want me to pray for on your side. And here's another thing. I see a large church building. And somehow I see Brother Hutchins. And you're standing in somebody's praise. It was me. I prayed for you at Brother Hutchins' church. The last time I was here, it was a blood clot laying on the heart and the Lord healed you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you now believe? Do you feel that 25 cents down in here? Can you see it's His presence, His goodness? I don't know you do, I, young lady. No. I know nothing of the woman. I have never seen her in all my life. I don't know her. But well, what does this do? Why, Jesus, it happened to him once, and strength went out of him, and I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. Then why would I have strength to stand here more than what he did? More takes place right now in this one meeting right here that's almost written in the Bible of what Jesus did when he was here on earth. Why? Why would he let me stand when his own self got weak? He said, more than this shall you do. These things that I do shall you do also. Even more, more of them, greater, shall you do. Because I go to my Father, and he is my strength. It fulfills his word. See, everything falls right to the word. If it's God doing it. Now, if the little lady, if God will describe to me and tell me what you're praying about, which you are Christian. And if you will tell me what you're praying about, would you believe? It's not for yourself. It's for someone else. That's your brother, a mental patient. That's life. That handkerchief that you have in your hand, go put it on you. it and believe with all your heart. God you, Are you believing? Having faith in God? Now, if thou canst believe. Now, those visions, of course, they make me weak. Perspiration on my hands and me chilling. You can tell. See? It's a weakness. Just not this one, night after night, year after year. But, sister, as far as I know, we're strangers to each other. I, I don't know you. God does know you. Now, if we're strangers to each other, so the audience will see, raise up your hand so you say, they'll know that we're strangers to each other. Now, we're, we're Christians here, and here's God's Bible, and our hands are up. We are strangers to each other. Now, this ought to settle it. You and the lion look this away. You everywhere watch and believe. Now, if Christ promised these things, Christ must do these things. If he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he's same in power. Is that right? He's the same in action. Is that right? He's the same in motive. He's the same in objective. He's the same in mercy. He's the same in attitude. He's the same. Do you believe it, lady sitting there? Little lady, you're on the front seat? All right. You've got a card in your hand, but you're not in the line. Do you believe me to be God's or er, servant? you believe it? If God will tell me what your trouble is, will you accept it and believe for your healing? You were looking so happy about it. Now, you're just asking in your heart to let me speak. Yes, ma'am? You want me to pray 
for a condition that's in your eyes and in your head. If that's right, raise up your hand. All right, you have it now. Just go on your road and throw your card away. And you can go and see what you ask for. I challenge your faith out there to believe that. Do you all believe? A woman, just at the same time, she's suffering there. The color lady has um, something in her her eyes, too, she wants to for. And she also has something wrong with her chest. That's right. You believe me to be God's prop, uh, servant? You believe that? You believe that you have your healing now? Cora, you really believe that? Miss Cora Smith, that's your name. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. And go. Your faith has saved you. And, uh, now, do you believe with all your heart? That's real, the little lady sitting here. <laughs> Are you at the end of the prayer line? Is that the patient? You're suffering awfully hard. You have arthritis. You have head trouble. You have hemorrhoids. You have a tumor in your stomach. That is right. Just turn around and go off the platform and go home and be well. Christ is here. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. If thou canst believe. Are you believing? Taking him as your healer, your savior? Now, to this person that's standing here. Now, let's just be real reverent. I didn't mean to hear, I have to follow the Spirit. See it's a, you see the picture of it. How many have ever seen the picture of the angel at night? Uh, don't you have it here? Some of them have. Gene, do you have them here? I don't know where you have the pictures or not. It's, it's, is it here? Um, this was by the FBI, fingerprinting documents. Here it is. The same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. It's in Washington, D.C. As the only supernatural beam was ever photographed, Germany got it three times in Germany with their camera last year, coming down, giving the determinant and going back. And George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI fingerprinting document, examined this. There's his right up on it. If the, that same angel is not two foot from where I'm standing right now. What is it? It's the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. How many knows that Jesus went to a pillar of fire when he left the earth? How many knows that? When he was here on earth, he said, I come from God. I go to God. When he was, how many knows that it was Jesus, the Logos, the, the angel of the covenant, the Christ that led the children of Israel through wilderness, he was the pillar of fire. He was the rock. He, the, then he went back to God. And when Paul met him on the road to Damascus, he was still that pillar of fire that even cut Paul's eyes out. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom you persecuted. Who was it come into the prison and taken Peter out that night, that night? The angel of the Lord has opened the doors and went out of the prison. Here he is down here, 1900 years later, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His work proves the same yesterday, today, and forever. His picture, his life. Well, you say, why don't I see it, Brother Bram? The people that was with Paul didn't see it. That's right. It's just so, if you just let God anoint your eyes, right. it would be open. Now let's talk to the lady. Lady, if the Lord Jesus will reveal what your trouble is, will you believe it? You believe. Now, I don't know you. 
and I have never seen it, but God does know it. You are suffering with a bleeding condition, bleeding ulcer. That's true. I see blood as that light moves over you. I see the blood dropping. The bleeding ulcer. Do you believe that Jesus will make you well? Now, or do you believe out there? Now, if I just say, or the Lord will tell me something else about the woman, just like he did a few minutes ago, how many of you will think then and believe, even you in the line here, will believe that the faith is anchored in your heart and the whole bunch of you can be healed right this minute? Do you believe that if the Lord will do it? The Lord knows that I don't know the woman. She knows that I don't know her. But see, we could carry this on here that's going on 11 o'clock. And we could just keep on going, see. But let this satisfy you. Oh, it's, I pray to God that you understand this is Christ knocking at your heart to come in. That you could talk to him and tell him what you need. Look at the people out there in the audience tonight without prayer cards. They wouldn't be up here. How that they speak, and the Lord walks right in, goes to something, he goes to speaking. You had this, that, or other, whatever it is. You see? Now, I don't know what he said that was their trouble. I don't remember it right now. Uh, bleeding, that's right, bleeding ulcer. Now let's just think a few moments and see. You're, you're conscious that something is going on. A feeling around you are uh, real, weak. Humble, meet Jesus. Isn't that right? All between you and I is that light moving. You do have something else on your heart to be prayed for. And that is your husband. A man. And he's suffering with something wrong in the lake. He was run over by an automobile over the lake, and here he's a barber. That's exactly right. Man. All right, it's over. Go down and the Lord Do you believe? Or how many of you say in your heart, Right now, blessed Lord, I have the purchase power of my healing. Raise your hand. I have the purchase power of my healing. Do you believe it? You're here to be prayed for. He knows your condition. Do you have the purchase power of your healing? Then let us raise our hands up to him, them that's able, like this. Now, real reverence, now you repeat this prayer after me. Almighty God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, I now thank thee for opening my understanding. I now believe that in my heart I am thoroughly convinced that Jesus Christ, thy Son, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I now accept him as my healer. I open my heart. I open the door of faith. I surrender all my faith to thee. Be Lord of my faith. I receive you now. Now with your head bowed, now that was your prayer. Now you stay shut in with God. Keep real quiet. Oh, brother, have you over this audience, thank you. That emerald greenish light. Praise God. Oh, what a confession means. Hallelujah. Over the audience. Surely you can understand I'm not a fanatic. I am your brother. The Lord Jesus is here in great power and presence to make you absolutely well. Hallelujah. Now just stay shut in and believe. Hallelujah. Believe that that's moving right down your soul, right down your heart. And while you're moving, stay shut in with it. I'm going to pray with you. And there's only one thing that will keep you from not receiving your need. That's that little shadow of darkness, just a little skeptic. A little bit under around you. I'm going to pray that God will remove that and one glorious burst of faith and every person be healed.
Lord Jesus, thou who hears confession and heard these people what they said, you've come, you've manifested yourself, and here they are sitting here with their hands in the air, their heads turned to the dirt from which you've taken them from, and they've been sick in their bodies, Satan has blinded them. But tonight he's defeated. Oh, Satan, you're just a bluff. And you're exposed. You were defeated at Calvary by our Lord Jesus. And we stand as Christians victorious tonight in his all-sufficient suffering, his vicarious death, his glorious resurrection. And we a purity by the living God through Jesus Christ that you leave these people everywhere yes. and come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Go and may each of these people be healed yes. for the glory of God.